In the current debate between Darwinism and intelligent design, the strongest argument made by Darwinists is this. In every other field of science, naturalism has been spectacularly successful. Why should evolutionary biology be so different? But it has long been obvious to the layman that evolution is different and requires a fundamentally different type of explanation. In recent years, a significant number of scientists have begun to recognize this also, as the astonishing dimensions of the complexity of life are revealed by scientific research, especially at the microscopic level. Here is a short story that may help viewers understand why evolution is different. The following discussion of the second law of thermodynamics is taken from Basic Physics by Kenneth Ford, but similar comments can be found in many other college physics textbooks. Imagine a motion picture of any scene of ordinary life run backward. You might watch a pair of mangled automobiles undergoing instantaneous repair as they back apart or a dead rabbit rising to scamper backward into the woods as a crushed bullet reforms and flies backward into a rifle. Or something as simple as a cup of coffee on a table gradually becoming warmer as it draws heat from its cooler surroundings. All of these backward-in-time views, and a myriad more that you can quickly think of, are ludicrous and impossible for one reason only. They violate the second law of thermodynamics. In the actual scene of events, entropy is increasing. In the time-reversed view, entropy is decreasing. Imagine a high school science teacher renting a video showing a tornado sweeping through a town, turning houses and cars into rubble. When she attempts to show it to her students, she accidentally runs the video backward. As Ford predicts, the students laugh and say, the video's going backward. The teacher doesn't want to admit her mistake, so she says, No, the video is not really going backward. It only looks like it is, because it appears that the second law is being violated. And of course entropy is decreasing in this video, but tornadoes derive their energy from the sun, and the increase in entropy on the sun is far greater than the decrease seen on this video, so there is no conflict with the second law. In fact, the teacher continues, meteorologists can explain everything that is happening in this video, and she proceeds to give a long, detailed, hastily invented scientific theory on how tornadoes, under just the right conditions, really can construct houses and cars. At the end of the explanation, one student says, I don't want to argue with scientists, but wouldn't it be a lot easier to explain if you ran the video the other way? Now imagine a professor describing the final project for students in his evolutionary biology class. Here are two pictures, he says. One is a picture of what the Earth must have looked like soon after it formed. The other is a picture of Chicago today, with tall buildings full of intelligent humans, computers, TV sets and telephones, with libraries full of science texts and novels, and jet airplanes flying overhead. Your assignment is to explain how we got from picture one to picture two, and why this did not violate the second law of thermodynamics. You should explain that three or four billion years ago, a collection of atoms formed by pure chance that was able to duplicate itself and these complex collections of atoms were able to pass their complex structures on to their descendants generation after generation, even correcting errors. Explain how, over a very long time, the accumulation of genetic accidents resulted in more and more complicated collections of atoms, and how eventually something called intelligence allowed some of these collections of atoms to design buildings in computers and TV sets, and write encyclopedias and science texts. But be sure to point out that while none of this would have been possible in an isolated system, the Earth is an open system, and entropy can decrease in an open system as long as the decreases 
are compensated by increases outside the system. As Isaac Asimov wrote in the Smithsonian Journal, remove the sun and the human brain would not have developed. And in the millions of years that it took for the human brain to develop, the increase in entropy that took place in the sun was far greater, far, far greater than the decrease that is represented by the evolution required to develop the human brain. The sun should play a central role in your essay. When one student turns in his essay some days later, he has written, A few years after picture one was taken, the sun exploded into a supernova. All humans and other animals died, their bodies decayed, and their cells decomposed into simple organic and inorganic compounds. Most of the buildings collapsed immediately into rubble. Those that didn't crumbled eventually. Most of the computers and TV sets inside were smashed into scrap metal. Even those that weren't gradually turned into piles of rust. Most of the books in the libraries burned up. The rest rotted over time. And you can see the final result many years later in picture two. The professor says, you have switched the pictures. I know, says the student, but it was so much easier to explain that way. Evolution is a natural process running backward. It has created things that natural forces only destroy. This is what makes it so different from other phenomena in our universe, and why it demands a very different sort of explanation. The compensation argument, used by a fictional character above to argue that because the Earth is an open system, tornadoes constructing houses and cars out of rubble here would not violate the second law and widely used by very real characters to argue that the spectacular increase in order seen on Earth does not violate it, was the target of a recent Applied Mathematics Letters article, A Second Look at the Second Law, by University of Texas El Paso mathematics professor Granville Sewell. In that article, Dr. Sewell defined X-entropy to be the entropy associated with any diffusing component X. If X is heat, for example, X entropy is just thermal entropy. And, since entropy measures disorder, he defined X order to be the negative of X entropy, and showed that the equations for entropy change not only say that X order cannot increase in an isolated system, they also say that in an open system, the X order cannot increase faster than it is imported through the boundary. Thus, the equations for entropy change do not support the illogical compensation idea. Instead, they illustrate the tautology that if an increase in order is extremely improbable when a system is isolated, it is still extremely improbable when the system is open unless something is entering, which makes it not extremely improbable. The fact that order is disappearing in the next room does not make it any easier for computers to appear in our room, unless this order is disappearing into our room, and then only if it is a type of order that makes the appearance of computers not extremely improbable, for example, if computers are entering. Importing thermal order into an open system may make the temperature distribution less random, and importing carbon order may make the carbon distribution less random, but neither makes the formation of computers more probable. Thus, Dr. Sewell concluded, Order can increase in an open system, not because the laws of probability are suspended when the door is open, but simply because order may walk in through the door. If we found evidence that DNA, auto parts, computer chips, and books entered through the Earth's atmosphere at some time in the past, then perhaps the appearance of humans, cars, computers, and encyclopedias on a previously barren planet could be explained without postulating a violation of the second law here. But if all we see entering is radiation and meteorite fragments, it seems clear that what is entering through the boundary 
cannot explain the increase in order observed here. The article was reviewed and accepted, but about a week before it was to be published, Dr. Sewell received a letter informing him that it had been withdrawn because our editors simply found that it does not consist of the kind of content that we are interested in publishing. The journal later published a formal apology acknowledging that it was withdrawn not because of any errors or technical problems found by the reviewers or editors, but because the editor-in-chief subsequently concluded that the content was more philosophical than mathematical. The listener may object that the biology professor in our story was not allowed to even mention natural selection, the one unintelligent force in the universe widely credited with the ability to create spectacular amounts of order out of disorder. However, that natural selection is capable of creating such order is now doubted by a growing number of scientists. In his book, The Edge of Evolution, Lehigh University biochemist Michael Behe looks in considerable detail at the struggle for survival between humans and the malaria parasite where, in the last century, the evolution of far more organisms can be studied than were involved in the entire natural history of mammals. He finds that the natural selection can be credited with some minor changes, but far and away the most extensive relevant data we have on the subject of evolution's effects on competing organisms is that accumulated on interactions between humans and our parasites. As with the example of malaria, the data show trench warfare with acts of desperate destruction, not arms races, with mutual improvements. The thrust and parry of human malaria evolution did not build anything. It only destroyed things. Behe also looks at Richard Lenski's 20-year E. coli experiment, which a June 9, 2008 New Scientist article claims represents the first time evolution has been caught in the act and concludes that nothing fundamentally new has been produced. Behe claims that the minor changes observed in this experiment are all due to breaking some genes and turning others off. Thus, it seems that perhaps natural selection of random mutations is like every other unintelligent cause in the universe after all, and tends to create disorder out of order, and not vice versa. The majority view of science today holds that physics explains all of chemistry, chemistry explains all of biology, and biology completely explains the human mind. Thus, physics alone explains the human mind and all it does. In fact, since there are only four known forces of physics, this means that these four forces must explain everything that has happened on Earth, according to this majority view. For example, Peter Urone, in College Physics, writes, One of the most remarkable simplifications in physics is that only four distinct forces account for all known phenomena. Perhaps we were unfair in not allowing our biology professor to discuss natural selection, which is the key to his theory as to how the four fundamental, unintelligent forces of physics alone could have rearranged the fundamental particles of physics into computers and books and jet airplanes. His theory is considered plausible by many people. But we were equally unfair to our high school science teacher in not providing the details of her theory on how tornadoes might be able to construct houses and cars out of rubble. It might have sounded plausible also.